the introduction is going to be short because I'm not, you know, I'm not so old that I'd have a long CV. Um, my main qualification for being here is that I've spent uh, most of my life in China, in Hong Kong, 50 years. And I spent much of that time working either professionally as a banking consultant in the field of finance and in relation to China's opening up to the outside world in particular, or as an academic, um, writing about Hong Kong and China. And uh, I puff myself and say I have a, a book that was published dealing with uh, the financial crisis and how it affected China this year. So, um, you know, it's a bit esoteric, but it's there to look at if people want. And it'll be available in another two or three months in Chinese. What I want to do this, this afternoon is really very simple. I want to ask the question and discuss it with you. If we were looking at Europe from Beij in Beijing as policymakers, what kind of ideas would come into our mind? What kind of attitudes would we have? What kind of responses? I think the most important thing we can do as Europeans when we're trying to see what the relationship should be between China and the Eurozone is to say, so how does China see these things? And of course, looking at things through a Chinese prism is very different to looking at China through the prism of the Irish Times, the Financial Times, or the New York Times. Curiously enough, China is far more critical about China than most of the foreign media are. Now, when I'm talking today, when I mention facts or, 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 or put forward um, assertions about China, I will be quoting the, either the official Chinese media or the IMF or World Bank, and usually I flag that for you. So let me just start. And this is China's view of Europe. And this, this statement was made earlier this month in the New China News Agency, the official news agency of the country, and they were discussing the reaction that Europeans had to the prospect that China might use its um, sovereign funds to buy Chinese bonds, and this would be China helping Europe. And uh, China says here quite clearly that no matter what happened, China has what they call a principal stand on European affairs. And this includes objections to the fact that the EU has what it called an obsolete mentality. And this obsolete mentality included things like whether the renminbi is overvalued or undervalued. That comes first. Then the high-tech export restrictions for strategic reasons. Arms sales, because there's an embargo for human rights reasons going back to June the 4th. And then human rights, which is things like t Tibet. So this is a whole range of issues that China feels it's got legitimate complaints against Europe, even before we get to talk about money. So it's a complicated position. But China is not an isolated country. It cannot afford to just say, we quarrel with Europe on human rights or things like that. It doesn't want to quarrel on, those, on that kind of basis. In fact, China's success as an economy is based almost entirely on a decision made by uh, the Chinese leadership to open the economy up to growth. And the driving force was the efficient world markets which wanted China's exports. And you can see what happened. China has grown from 2% of world GDP to 9% of world GDP. Its share of world exports has gone from 1% in 1978, when the formal start of the reforms began, to 10% last year. It's a huge rise. And then its world trade ranking, it was 29th in the world in 1978, and it was second in 2010. So China has become a very global economy. And I throw one more figure at you to show how global this huge growth in foreign trade is generated mostly by foreign investment and very much by foreign firms actually manufacturing, trading, 
on the ground in China. In this sense, it's far more open than most advanced economies. 55% of China's foreign trade is created, is generated by foreign financed firms. There's a huge proportion. So China has these global partnerships. And China, because it's such a huge exporter, because it does take so much foreign investment to modernize the country, it is integrated into the world in a very real way. Now, it becomes a close partner, a very close partner of both the United States and the EU. We tend not to understand, though, this is not a partnership of equals. We tend to overestimate how big the Chinese economy is. The Chinese economy produces about six trillion US dollars worth of GDP. The United States is around 16 trillion, and the European Union is also around 16 trillion. So China is a very substantial economy, but it's still highly dependent on its relationship with the United States and the European Union because these offer the biggest, the most prosperous markets. As a result, the Chinese government is continually aware of the fact that because of its own trading interests, it cannot just do whatever it wants to do. It has to bear in mind the effect on other countries and how they will respond. And I'm talking about responding economically and responding positively. And in addition to that, which is very important for us in Europe, very important, China needs to use the world's two largest financial centers. And they happen to be New York and London. And London is not part of the Eurozone. So we should bear that in mind. There is no financial services center in Europe which can match London, continental Europe, which can match London and New York, which means that as far as China is concerned, when you have such large flows of money for trade, which means foreign investment, foreign exchange transactions and so on, you have to use London and New York. So China does have huge sums of money, and they've grown dramatically in the last five years. So they've, um, they've, they've doubled. Uh, in the middle of this year, China had 3.1 trillion US dollars worth of reserves, and it's now 3.2. That's roughly half the total GDP. It's an enormous sum. It was only 1.5 in 2007. Now, China is trying to change its foreign exchange policy, and it wishes to abolish foreign exchange controls by 2015. We need to bear that in mind, because the arguments about the value of the Chinese currency and their foreign exchange reserves and so on and so forth begin with the fact that the state decides the value of China's currency, not the exchange markets. And that the money going into China becomes state money because when you go into China as an investor, you hand your foreign currency over to the bank and the bank then hands it over to the exchange control, state administration of foreign exchange, or to the People's Bank of China. And it shows up as a state asset. So this is a complicated situation. Most people here who are Irish cannot remember exchange controls and cannot remember the uh, a sterling relationship that, that Ireland used to have. But for China, exchange controls are a very serious matter indeed, and they hope to abolish them by 2015 as part of the modernization, but in the meantime, we have them. The general expectation is that when the exchange controls are abolished, the renminbi will be such a powerful country that it will rival a currency that it will, revive, it will rival and overtake the United States dollar and the euro. I must tell you, the Chinese leadership does not believe that. And President Hu Jintao earlier this year said it will take a very long time to establish the renminbi as an international currency. So again, there's a mismatch between the perceptions of would-be investors and the Chinese leadership who are actually running things. So why are there exchange controls? Why does the country keep them when most other places abolish them? And the reasons are, first of all, they protect the country against politi importing political and economic instability. 
And for China, this has been proved very useful in two major crises. In 1997, 1998, there was an Asian financial crisis, which caused havoc. But China was insulated because it had exchange controls. You couldn't speculate against the renminbi because you, you could only buy and sell renminbi at the official price. You couldn't go into China to buy assets without getting exchange control permission. You couldn't sell assets in China and come out without getting control. And then again in 2007, the exchange controls helped to keep some, not all of it now, but some, the worst of the the, the chaos in the outside world away from China. So it's proved its, it's proved its worth. The second thing is that the state in China can fix the exchange rate according to the national interest. You know, this is what governments like to do. You know, national interest comes first, and why not? It, it, it means you've got order. And for a country that's trying to develop, it's much more convenient for the state to decide the goals that you're going to aim at and not be distracted by markets. And finally, they protect China's banking from the much more efficient and much stronger foreign competition that they would other otherwise face. And again, the Chinese government is quite frank about this, that Chinese banking is still in the process of being reformed and developed. But again, the Chinese government wishes to get rid of exchange controls by 2015, although the target is not cast in stone. So, so the current case for caution, you know, the, the global financial crisis is over. Most people think that China did very well. So why keep exchange controls now? Why does the government need to be cautious about reforms? And the first one is that in 2009, the IMF said that the correlation between efficiency and profits in Chinese banking was zero other than in Hong Kong, which operates with its own currency and its own banking system. So in 2009, the Chinese banking was seriously, seriously inefficient by world standards. Then the second thing is, the second quote that I'd like to uh, give you here is from a very senior political figure in China who um, in, in September at an international forum made this astonishing statement that borrowing in 2009 by thousands of companies set up by local governments to fund construction is the nation's equivalent of the US subprime, subprime crisis, mortgage crisis. And he's warning the country and also its outside financial partners that when you liberalize, when you reform, then you'll let the market take over and then you're more likely to get the kind of crises than scandals that you had in the United States. But he's saying also it happened. Now, does China have crises? Now, most of you think, no, to be Chinese is to be the most fortunate person in the modern world. You know, the government pushes crises and, 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 and economic problems aside. Growth takes place spontaneously at 10% per annum every year, year after year. And, and Chinese officials say, we wish. <laughs> so here, here's a quotation, two quotations for you. Wen Zhao is a town, a city of nine million people in a province called Zhejiang. Wenzhou is famous for its businessmen. It may be the most capitalist city in China. And I quote here from the China Daily, which is the official English language newspaper of, of China. And they described Wenzhou as the city where BMWs, Ferraris, or Lamborghinis, and self-made millionaires abound. And they also talk about the people of Wenzhou being born with a business gene, right? That was last year. This year, the head of the province of Zhejiang's Communist Party made a speech in which he said, more than 90 tycoons have disappeared, committed suicide, or declared bankruptcy, leaving behind personal debts of 1.6 US uh, billion dollars. So again, what I'm saying to you, you know, is for the Chinese government, these are serious issues as we, to move, to invest, to reform, to go Western, has its costs. And when we take it for granted that the Chinese government is there just for us to sell them a product and take their money, we're wrong. You know, they, 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 they have plenty of experience of how things don't go smoothly. 
Now, for China, I mentioned local government. For China, it has its equivalent of a crisis, which is the same kind of crisis which overtakes economies which are part, which have been globalized. They're inescapable. China decided to rescue itself from the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, with a 586 billion US dollar stimulus package. The problem was only 27% of that was funded by the central government. The rest was to be got from the private sector or local government, mostly local government. Immediately it happened, the head of the bank, well, within months, in November uh, 2009, the head of the Bank of China, one of China's big four, said this has already caused systemic risk to our system. So he's on guard, he's warning people, the official media publishes uh, his warning. <coughs> they have the same kind of problems, although more easily controlled than the Europeans have. And you want to know what kind of problems they have. You know, when they started to, to, to try and reform this system in 22, to clean up the mess, they had huge arguments about how many vehicles, how many of these local government uh, vehicles had borrowed money. Now, the National Audit Office has an estimate, which is the most official one, which is 6,500. The central bank said there were 10,000 or more. And the banking regulator said he'd go for 9,000 or more. But, you know, if you're quarreling about how many, how many firms are going to go bankrupt, you can see you have difficulties. I apologize. There we are. OK. So why is the Chinese government saying now it wants to liberalize the renminbi? Why does it want to abolish controls now, despite the heavy weight of these financial challenges which I've, I've mentioned to you? The first is the Chinese government knows that unless the banking system because, becomes competitive, like manufacturing, that China's takeoff on a steady, upward track where it will have the full benefits of modernization, modern technology, modern know-how, and globalization will not be able to reach you know, uh, uh, their, their full potential. So this is part of the, 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 the commitment of the Chinese government and the Chinese leadership that goes back 30 years to have competition driving and modernizing all sectors of the economy. The second reason that they want, want to do it, need to do it, is to take the exchange risk off the government. Because right now, when they sell, when a foreign investor comes in and buys renminbi, to his credit in the bank account is written renminbi. And since everybody thinks the renminbi is going to increase in value, when he wants to get his money out, he wants the renminbi at the increased value, doesn't he? Which means the state will make a loss in paying him the new exchange rate, the new and higher exchange rate. So the Chinese government would like to make foreign investors and foreign traders carry their own exchange risks, which means you know, that the market sets the rates rather than the government, and the money belongs to you all the way through. So that's the second factor. The third factor is that the Chinese government believes that if you can get rid of exchange controls, then you'll, then you'll uh, uh, take away an important advantage that foreigners have at the moment, which is that they have easier access to funding internationally. And they think that if they can open up the whole of the financial services market, then export growth will not be the thing that's driving everything. Right now, it's driving everything because all this foreign investment comes in, Chinese are have been very dependent on foreign investment. They're less so now. They're moving away from it. But historically, they are. And so that means the investments tend to go into industries which find their markets overseas. And they're being dictated to. The, the, the agenda is being driven by the world economy in a way which is probably excessive. If you get rid of exchange controls, you remove a distortion, and things will settle down and, 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 and be more balanced from the Chinese point of view. So these are, these are three perfectly valid reasons for saying we want to liberalize and we want to do it in the next four years. Now, we prepare for the globalization of the renminbi. Once the renminbi is free from exchange controls, first thing that will happen, 
And it's beginning to happen already, is that the Chinese investor, either the government, the state, or corporations or individuals, diversify. And we can see the Chinese government pressing state-owned organizations to buy foreign assets. I mean, the, the, the headlines in the papers tend to go for their purchase of oil fields, uh, 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 iron ore resource mines, and things of that sort. But they are also investing in production plants in Indonesia and in Brazil. There's a lot of outflow from China already. So the diversification is there, but it will become much more rapid when Chinese investors are able to decide for themselves where the most attractive returns are. That means the state steps back, and it will be market-driven instead of by these three organizations, state organizations as it is at the moment. At that point, the Eurozone has a lot to offer. To repeat myself, Euro, Euro assets are certainly undervalued by the markets. I mean, I was talking to somebody at the American Embassy who deals with foreign American in, uh, 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 FDI into Ireland, and he says the flow remains unchanged. If you look at the performance of the German economy, despite the complaints, the German economy's you know, uh, 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 growth is relatively healthy. And if we look at the Irish economy in more detail, it is astonishing how despite the complaints about our labor force and productivity and so on, Ireland is one of the leaders in the Eurozone in terms of its exports, particularly business services, which is astonishing after an international financial crisis. So the Eurozone has things which you know, other people outside the Euro can buy right now for very cheap prices. And I have no doubt at all that the process of liberalization of the renminbi will encourage more and more uh, uh, Irish investors, uh, I'm sorry, more and more Chinese investors to take the euro more seriously than they do at the moment. We had an address here recently, a very, very good address by some, some uh, uh, three academics from the UK. The interesting thing about that was how little information they had on what was taking place, which of course suggests that it's not high profile or high volume, but that will change with liberalization. And I guess we will then move into a somewhat similar position to the United States, even if we don't have an international financial center. And then definitely the Chinese wish to rebalance from the, U from the US dollar if they can, and if we can provide them with the, with the facilities and the products. But there is a policy question which is very difficult for us to answer. Will the euro? continue to retain its surprising strength against the US dollar. I mean, for all the talk about the euro being busted, when is it going to end, the exchange rate is roughly the same as it was at the beginning of the year. And throughout most of this year, it's been, I guess you could say from month to month, at least as strong, if not stronger than last year. This is, you know, a feature of the, of the eurozone reporting on itself and how the market is behaving. But maybe the, maybe the pessimists are right. The euro will come under pressure. When will that happen? And, you know, these are key questions for a country like China, which has such vast resources uh, in terms of foreign exchange under state control. Now, I'll remind you, I think we need to remind ourselves, we need to remind ourselves of the competition we face. So this is the benchmark the US, and the United States is incredibly efficient. We don't see that, that's not reported. 2009, New York securities industry profits were the highest in history. They were three times the level in 2006. I mean, that's what financial services do. The market's down, I make, mon make money selling on the downside. The market's up, I make money selling on the upside. You look at this one. We tend to think that market intervention by the state is bad. It must be a waste of resources. You know, it's all going to be, have to be written off. The taxpayer is being, being robbed. 2008, 2009, in New York, the market refused to put money into Citigroup. And Citigroup looked like a busted flush. So New York, the, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York bought equity worth $45 billion, right? And this is, you know, it's not an insignificant amount of money. Would it have rescued Allied, uh, 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 Anglo, uh, 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 
<laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they made 12 billion within less than two years on the investment. This, this is America. It's got this resilience, this ability to overcome challenges and so on. And then we think of, of, of things like TARP or the, the rescue package that we looked for in Europe. We're saying a billion, a trillion dollars. Wow, end of the world. How can we do it? And it will all be wasted. You know, Bush, right-wing Bush, announced TARP to rescue his financial services system. And they spent 700 billion on it. And you go back and read the press at the time, wasted, taxpayers ruined. It was all paid back by the end of 2010. And I'm not advocating intervention. I make no comment on policy for either the Eurozone or for Ireland or America. I don't live in these economies. I just note that this is what we have to compete with in the Eurozone. So I have one more thing, and it's, it's this, and it's... Um, it's to do with China's big asset in the international financial services market. We do have a competitor, and it's called Hong Kong. Hong Kong is part of China. Hong Kong is a truly serious international financial center. And this constantly gives China the alternative. Hong Kong has 71 of the largest banks in the world. It's the first in the world for the last three years in IPOs on uh, terms of equity raised. You know, you look at these figures, seventh largest in the world in foreign exchange trading, the first in terms of FDI flows into China since 1978, and it's already raised 384 billion US dollars worth of, of uh, uh, equity for Chinese corporations in Hong Kong since 1993. I mean, you know, this is a serious place also that we should think of as competing with Europe, competing with Ireland for the mainland's business, and it's part of China. So what I'm going to do, if I may, is say that I've spoken for more than enough. Um, the chairman kindly didn't interrupt me, and say, you know, I've, I'm very privileged to have this audience. I've been studying your faces, and you've been extremely polite, and, uh, you know, the interaction with you has been excellent. So I'm very grateful to you, and it will be a privilege to have feedback, comment, criticism, objections. Thank you very much.